Hello, folks, and thank you so much for joining us here today. We're going to give everyone a couple minutes to log on to the call and get settled, uh, but we really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to come be with us. Uh, my name is Aurora grant Mavini, and I work for the National Association of Community Health Workers as their member and partner engagement associate, and I have had the pleasure of working uh, with the American Diabetes Association on their focus on diabetes project. And this is a project uh, with, which is supported by Vision Care and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. Um, and the initiative is to focus on the crucial role annual comprehensive eye exams play in the early detection, intervention, and prevention of eye disease and vision loss caused by diabetes uh, by targeting the gaps in the most prevalent comorbidities associated with diabetes um, and this is a campaign that helps to bend the curve in preventing and reducing the risk of diabetes-related eye disease. Um, you can read more about that on the ADA's website. And in addition, I'm going to throw in the chat our webpage on Focus on Diabetes, where you can see uh, what we've been doing so far in terms of partnering. Uh, we are doing some trainings, we've done some one-pagers, uh, and we are really happy to connect folks with their really wonderful wonderful resources. Um, in addition, this is supposed to be a round table, so please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat and network. Uh, we love seeing uh, all the folks from across the country come together on these sorts of issues. We know diabetes is a huge cross-cutting issue for the CHW profession. Um, in addition, if you are looking for some diabetes trainings as part of the Focus on Diabetes initiatives, we are doing one in partnership with Focus on Diabetes at, in September. We have one in uh, September 14th in English and later in the month in Spanish. Folks can sign up on our website. This is a training designed really specifically for community health workers. Uh, so we're very excited about it. Um, and with that, while I introduce our wonderful panel of experts, I want to go ahead and launch our first poll question uh, for folks to mull over while you uh, listen to their introductions. Uh, here today, we have Lauren Hieronymus, who holds a doctorate in nursing practice and is a master licensed diabetes educator, board certified advanced diabetes manager, and certified diabetes uh, care and education specialist with over 30 years experience in diabetes care and education. Uh, Dr. Hieronymus is a vice president of eye care programs at the American Diabetes Association. And she is also an adjunct uh, associate professor for the College of Nursing at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. We also have with us uh, Daniel Stinson, uh, who attained a master's degree in community nutrition in, and is a master licensed diabetes educator and certified diabetes care and education specialist with over three decades professional experience in the areas of nutrition and diabetes care and education. He is the senior manager of the education recognition program at the American Diabetes Association and currently serves on the Kentucky Board of Licensed uh, Diabetes Educator. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Jessica Grogan here with us today, who holds a master's of science degree in health and human performance and is a certified diabetes care and educated specialist and a certified case manager with over 10 years of experience in healthcare and diabetes education. Uh, Mrs. Grogan is a director for community engagement and impact at the American Diabetes Association. She has a passion for health and wellness in her own life and has translated that into her career. So once again, thank you all so much for being here and working with us on this program. I am going to end the first poll question in just one minute. Thank you so much for the vast majority on the call who have completed it. Uh, the poll asks, who is at risk of developing diabetic eye disease? I'm going to give folks 20 more seconds to, to answer before we close the poll. I'm gonna share the results here. And with that, I am delighted to hand it over to Dr. Hieronymus to lead us into the first part of our discussion. All right, so um, 
What you saw with the polling question is basically who is at risk of developing diabetic, keyword, eye disease. And so the answer for that is anyone who has chronic illness of diabetes. Now, if you have a family history of diabetes, it increases your risk for developing diabetes. But for developing the actual eye disease associated with diabetes, it would be um, anyone who has the chronic illness, diabetes, either type, chronic illness. So let's talk for a few minutes about eye health. <clears throat> First off, did you know that August is National Eye Exam Month? Now we've got two days left. So if you need an eye exam and you've not had it, you wanna do it in eye exam month, go for it. Why do people with diabetes need eye examinations? Well, first off, because it's the leading cause of vision loss in people 18 to 64 years old who have diabetes. There's no obvious signs, so you really can't feel it until the damage is great. But the good news is having an annual routine eye exam can prevent 95% of vision loss caused by diabetes. So if you remember the classroom, a 95% is an A. So we want everybody to get an A in terms of, of getting their eye exams early and on a routine basis to help prevent uh, vision loss caused by diabetes. So I wanna mention just a little bit about our Focus on Diabetes uh, project. Aurora talked a little bit about it, but basically this American Diabetes Association Focus on Diabetes Initiative brings together organizations in vision care, which is the ADA, also uh, Vision Care and Regeneron, two different companies that work with us to sponsor this project. We bring together these organizations to increase the awareness of, help reduce, treat, and manage diabetes-related eye, eye disease. These eye diseases include diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema, which is a leading cause of blindness in the working age adult. Again, good news, we can prevent this 95%. We all need to push individuals with diabetes to have an annual comprehensive eye exam, which is the first critical step to preserve their vision. We have a Focus on Diabetes website with lots of different eye resources, which I will share in a few minutes in the chat. We also have a retinopathy risk test. Now, when I visited with you guys before, I mentioned it, but I just wanna let you know, this is a great tool to help individuals do it themselves, DIY, do it yourself, and really they then get the answers to help them understand their risk for retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy or eye disease. It's available in English and Spanish. It'll ask what type of diabetes do you have? What's your gender? When were you diagnosed with diabetes to give an idea of how long uh, the person would have had it? Have you had diabetic retinopathy or been diagnosed with that? What's your latest A1C? What's your latest blood pressure? Ask for both the top and the bottom numbers. And then it'll provide for you a low, medium, or high risk for retinopathy based on um, your answers. It goes from zero to 4.5. So it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. It doesn't provide medical device, excuse me, medical advice, but it does give you sort of a, an idea of where you are with your risk there. So I'm gonna share my screen. I just wanna show you what the page looks like. And then in just a few minutes, we'll go to the next, um, the, uh, the next polling question. So let me see, I'll share my screen. Oops. There we go. Can you guys see it, the wrist test? 
No. Can you see the risk test? You see in teams? No, we're not able to, to see you sharing your screen. Okay. Did, did you allow me to share? Yes, you should have. There we go. Okay. okay. Can you see it now, the risk test? Yes. Okay. So this is what it looks like, and it then will present to you, see the zero to the 4.5%, and you'll see um, you know, where your A1C is, uh, what your blood pressure is, where you are with um, um, uh, your risk. So it's, it's just great. It's very visual, very good in terms of um, uh, taking a look at your risks. Okay. All right. Next polling question, Aurora. I think we're ready. Thank you, Laura. And thank you all so much for those who are just joining. You should have a poll question uh, popping up on your screen right now that says, what should a person with diabetes eat? Uh, with four options, a strict keto diet, there is no diabetes diet, a strict paleo diet, or ice cream YOLO as our final choice. We will leave that open. Uh, for about a minute, and I see the results are, are pouring in. Thank you so much. Um, and after that, get it one more minute. See, folks are still responding. Thank you. Results still coming in. Okay, we're gonna end it there. We're gonna share results. And it looks like the majority of folks said B, there is no diabetes diet at 76%. And I'm gonna hand it over to Daniel to lead us in our next part of discussion. Thank you, Aurora. Great job, everyone. So uh, the answer uh, to the question is B. Uh, that there is no standard uh, diabetic uh, diet. Um, now, this was not always the case. Uh, several years ago, uh, meal planning uh, for a person with diabetes was much more uh, regimented. In fact, there were actually precise recommendations for carbohydrate, fat, and protein. But this has changed over the years because what nutrition science has taught us is that a wide variety of foods can be selected by a person who has diabetes while still controlling their blood glucose levels. Meal planning for diabetes must be individualized. Uh, that's the only way that someone is gonna follow a meal plan long-term. It has to be individualized based upon a person's food preferences, eating patterns, lifestyle, finances, and other considerations, including other health issues. There are currently various plans out there um, that are quite popular for managing a person's diabetes as well as other um, health issues, such as keto, as well as paleo. While individuals can do have success with those type of plans, they're not always right for everyone for the reasons that we discussed above. So because of this, what I would like to do is to present some practical suggestions for a person to control their blood sugar as well as live a healthier life overall. So when we're talking about blood sugar, one of the things that most influences blood sugar in terms of our food choices is looking at what we call carbohydrate consistency. So regular meals or, and or snacks throughout the day certainly can help with a person's blood sugar. Since carbohydrate is the primary fuel that the body uses to break down and turn into glucose, having carbohydrates consistent throughout the day can help prevent extreme highs and lows in blood sugar. And this is especially important when the person is on diabetes medications 
injectables, and or insulin. Another thing that we'd like to look at in terms of managing diabetes with food choices is through portion control. Label re reading can be very helpful um, to allow an individual to see the carbohydrates that's in the foods that they're consuming. Using devices such as smaller plates, smaller bowls, cups, spoons can help increase awareness, but also to help decrease the carbohydrates that are being consumed, as well as overall calories, if weight loss is also a goal for the individual. Something else that we want to consider when we're looking at meal planning for diabetes and helping to control blood sugar is trying to make sure that the diet is also balanced. Uh, we're particularly looking at what we call macronutrients, the carbohydrate, fat, protein, but also what we call the micronutrients, the vitamins and the minerals that are really important, not just for a person with diabetes, but for all of us for good overall health. So the ideal is to select a variety of foods, ranging from lean proteins, whole grown fruits and vegetables, low fat dairy products, and also your healthy grains. So one of the things I suggest to individuals is to try to eat the color spectrum. Vitamins and minerals are often concentrated in different color food groups. So when we eat the color spectrum, we're gonna increase our chances of consuming more of those vitamins and minerals that our bodies need. One of the other things that we can use to help with meal planning is a method that's been around for several years and that can be very effective is utilizing the plate method. The plate method is a very, very simple but effective way of helping to ensure that you're consuming smaller portions of more variety of foods. So with the plate method, we're taking a smaller plate we're using a nine inch plate. We're roughly dividing it in half. And half of that plate is going to be comprised of those non starchy vegetables green beans, cauliflower, broccoli, so forth. One quarter of the plate is going to be a lean protein. The other quarter of the plate is going to be a starchy vegetable sweet potatoes, mashed potatoes, corn, peas, so forth. The plate can be complemented with a small piece of fruit and also a beverage, preferable water. So by incorporating some of these concepts, it helps an individual to plan long-term. Oftentimes diets are short-term focused. Again, because of the fears that we discussed, they're not long-term implemented. So the strategy that I suggest as a dietitian and a diabetes educator is looking at these practical suggestions to help with blood sugar control. And if you are interested in some additional resources, I will put up in the chat. The American Diabetes Association does have some excellent resources um, at Shop Diabetes and also Diabetes Food Hub. Thank you so very much. And I will turn it back over to you, Laura. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I'm gonna launch our third poll question here. Uh, you should see something pop up on your screen with the question, regular exercise can help prevent diabetic eye disease. And is that true or false? Uh, folks are replying right now. We'll give folks a minute. And thank you guys so much for participating and throwing things in the chat. Um, after our presentations from our guests, we're going to have a Q&A period. So as we go along, if you have questions, feel free to throw them in there. We're going to give it about 10 more seconds on the poll, and then we'll uh, pause and share the results.
Great, thank you folks. I'm gonna share that on screen and it looks like 77% said true and 23% said false. And I'll hand it over to you, Jessica. Hi, thank you. I wish we had put ice cream for YOLO as choice number C there and seen how many people pick that. <laughs> Um, but the answer is true that regular exercise can help prevent or reduce your risk for eye disease. Regular exercise lowers your intraocular pressure in your eye and it improves your blood flow to the retina and the optic nerve. And those things help improve the blood flow to your eye and prevent damage. Physical activity is important for everyone with diabetes. Most forms of aerobic or cardiovascular exercise will reduce your blood glucose levels. Your cells will become more sensitive to exercise and can lower your blood glucose over time. It's important to note though, when you're working with someone or it's yourself, that exercise to a high intensity can raise blood sugar. So if you can imagine someone that is doing some high energy exercises, weightlifting, competitive sports. You may find um, younger individuals in school with type one diabetes and they're competing at different levels. They may have increases in their blood sugar with that high intensity. So being mindful of who you're working with, whether it's yourself or someone else and where their blood sugar is. Always having a blood glucometer available so that you can check. Um, breathing is key. So if you are doing a high intensity exercise, try to incorporate some relaxation into your overall activity. Uh, but for the most part, the majority of us, we would like to aim for 150 minutes of physical activity, moderate intensity activity per week. Um, moderate intensity basically means that it's difficult to carry on a conversation. So you should be walking at a fast enough pace where you're hopping a little bit. You can uh, get out every word very clearly. Maybe you can talk, but you can't quite sing it. 150 minutes a week could vary down to 30 minutes, five days a week, 25 minutes, six days a week. Personally, I like to just tell people to aim for 30 minutes every day. Because if there's a day that you fall short, it's okay because the next day is there to pick up right where you left off. Um, 30 minutes a day doesn't have to be overwhelming. Break it down however you can. Three 10 minute sessions, a 15, two 15 minute sessions. Doesn't have to be a gym workout, any expensive equipment. You can get off at a different bus stop to walk a little further. You can take an extra lap around the grocery store or the Walmart, anything you can to get a little extra activity in. Um, for myself, before I worked at the ADA, I worked at a large hospital. Parking was always difficult and I'd forget where I parked if I didn't park in the same spot every day. So I'd just park in the same far back lot and to get to the time clock in time, I hustled. And so I couldn't carry on a conversation if I was walking with somebody because I was moving as quickly as I could. And that took about five to 10 minutes that counted as into my total throughout the day. So making it attainable for yourself, having a SMART goal. A SMART goal is something that's specific. What are you trying to do? You're trying to lose weight. Well, how? Um, what measure are you trying to do? How many, how many pounds? How many days per week? Is it attainable? If you tell yourself, I'm gonna lose 100 pounds, that's a, that's a lot to chew off all at once take it down to five pounds per month or one pound per month, making your goals attainable for yourself, um, doing relevant activities. I'm not gonna sign up for a 10K or a marathon, but I'll sign up for a 5K. I'll sign up for a mile walk with friends and families to do extra activities and making it time relevant so that you know to, after a month, reevaluate where you are able to reach in your goal. Can you do more? or do you need to reevaluate and do a little less? So making it a SMART goal. Um, the most important thing for anyone with diabetes and exercise is to make sure you're consulting your doctor, or your diabetes care team. Uh, this will include going over your blood glucose range that's best for you, um, your blood pressure range as well. The important thing is to start slow, um, and to 
listen to your body. Um, and like Daniel and Laura, I'll put some resources in the chat as well. Thank you, Jessica. We have another poll question for folks to uh, fill out. It's a little bit of sort of trivia for folks. Uh, uh, the question is, what is the estimated number of people who are undiagnosed with diabetes in the US? Um, I wish I had a little Jeopardy music to play for folks, but thank you, you guys. The results are pouring in as usual. Um, and the options are 500,000 uh, million, 8.5 million, or 15 million. We'll give that another 30 seconds or so, so folks have a chance to, to think and respond. And thank you, Jessica, for throwing that resource in the chat. And also folks, just so you know, all these resources are also gonna be emailed to you uh, after the session. So lots of big numbers there, right? Looks like the lottery. <laughs> um, so if you're gonna pick the lottery winnings, it would be the top number. But we're not quite up to 15 million uh, undiagnosed people with diabetes. So about a third of the population with diabetes is undiagnosed, primarily type two diabetes. So that would be 8.5 million individuals, 8,500,000 individuals are undiagnosed. Now, the good news is I've been around a while, about 30 years in diabetes care and education. It used to be half. So we've done a little bit better, but we still got a lot of work to do in terms of diagnosing individuals with diabetes. Okay, let's take a look at the last polling question and then I'll wrap up. One second, going ahead and launching that. Folks should see that on the screen. The question is, what risk factors for type two diabetes can you help manage? Uh, is it A, blood pressure, B, cholesterol, C, blood glucose or sugar, or D, all of the above? Once again, thank you folks for, for participating. Uh, and we'll give you a couple seconds to, to answer the question. And let me share those results again. And it looks like the majority of folks picked D, all of the above. Very good, very good. So um, really the other two answers aren't, aren't wrong, but actually all three of them can make a difference in helping you manage your diabetes as well as help to prevent the complications of diabetes, the long-term complications such as eye disease. And the things that we've talked about, your regular eye exam, the um, routine, regular exercise and physical activity, the meal planning, all of that, all of that is important for your overall diabetes care. And all of that can help manage all of these things, blood pressure, cholesterol, as well as blood glucose. So important things for people with diabetes. Now we talked about the fact that the third of the population are not diagnosed, they don't know they have diabetes. And one of the things, and I'll share the link in the chat in a little bit, one of the things that we can do is we can push individuals to take our pre-diabetes type two diabetes risk test, all right? It's an online tool available in English and Spanish, similar to the retinopathy risk test that is specific to, diet, to retinopathy. But this one is about, are you at risk for prediabetes or type two? Um, you can take it for yourself. You can take it for someone else, a family member. It will look, again, it's available in English or Spanish. It'll ask you how old you are. No one's looking. So you can tell it how old you are. What is your gender? 
if you select woman, it will ask you if you had gestational diabetes, which is generally a temporary type of diabetes that occurs during pregnancy, usually close to around the third trimester. It'll ask you if you have a mother, a father, sister, or brother with diabetes. So we do know that diabetes, type two diabetes, runs in families, it's a genetic disorder. And so it will ask you that question. Uh, mother, father, sister, or brother are considered primary relatives. You know, very close kin, if you will. It'll ask you if you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, if you're physically active, what ethnicity are you? Certain ethnic groups have a higher incidence of prediabetes and type two diabetes. It'll ask you for your height and weight and it'll automatically calculate your body mass index or your BMI. Then you'll give it an email address and it will email your results to you so that you can take them with you. You can print them and take them with you to your, um, to your uh, diabetes care or your, excuse me, your healthcare provider. Each question when you're completing the, the risk test, you can hover over and it, it, it contains a why does this matter? So if you wanna learn more about the genetics for diabetes, the importance of physical activity, your BMI and what that means to your risk for diabetes, you can find all that out online in the comfort of your own spot with your computer. So diabetes occurs in about 11% of the United States population with a lot of diabetes. It just keeps going up. Um, some of the things that are important is that people become educated and our ADA has national standards that we follow for diabetes self-management education and support. Um, we have education recognition programs that you can refer people to. But the key is letting them get these messages, helping them understand the importance of taking care of themselves. Um, we also have an Ask the Experts events. These are really neat. You can, uh, you can attend. You can encourage people with diabetes to attend. Um, we have an Ask the Experts events that are specific to eye health different experts and medical specialties and other authorities in diabetes eye health answer questions, they give advice and they share knowledge. So it's sort of an open forum, you know, for questions to get answered that are specific to the topic of the event. So as I mentioned earlier, our focus on diabetes is made possible with support from our visionary partners, VSP Vision Care and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. So I guess with that, we'll open it up for questions. Any questions? Anybody take the risk test while we were talking? Is the risk test just for, is it something that we give to the patients? Is it something that can be done in writing? Yes. Because mm -hmm. everybody doesn't have a computer. It's true. Or... It's true. And if you're like me, what's your name? What's your name? I can't say it. Yvonne Helms. From so Yvonne, Health Center. I don't know about you, but if you're like me, I can't see it on my phone. You know, if I try to call it up on my phone, there's a lot of individuals that you just can't see it or I'll, my fingers are pretty good size. Can everybody hear? I can't hear. Laura, we seem to have lost your, your audio. Yeah, you might just want to try to mute and unmute for a second. Did that work? Perfect. Yay, it worked. So anyway, uh, yes. So not being able to see it, get to it, whatever. We recognize that a lot of people really like the, um, 
the um, paper version. And so there's a PDF on the website if you go to the actual risk test link, which is listed there. I see so, that Jennifer has a question. Yes. Um, I wanted to double check a statistic. You said that um, a third of the population is undiagnosed. Is that correct? With, yeah. So if you take the whole population with diabetes. Okay, that's that's what I was confused about. The whole population with diabetes. Yes. yes a third yes. of those are undiagnosed. Yes, yes. That's that was Only what I meant. Two thirds know that they actually have it, okay. which is why we really promote that risk test because you know we want people to see and. Interestingly enough, some of the questions that we mentioned, you know, you, you can share your age with the risk test. And we mentioned that, you know, your age matters. So about one in four of individuals 65 or older have diabetes. That's 25% of 65 and older. You know, so if last year you were 64 and you barely missed being high risk and you turned 65 this year and nothing else has changed, Y'all at once, you will be at much higher risk. Does that make sense? Yeah. So just one and done is not good enough for the risk test. You know, you need to periodically take it, especially if you creep up number wise to become at, at you know, higher risk. Thank you. Great question. What else? What other questions do we have? I see someone in the chat, Ethel said A1C is 10. Uh, what should I do next? Um, so let me just ask Ethel, uh, or is this a new thing for you? Or I'm guessing you already have diabetes, correct? So if that's the case and your A1C is 10, you need to get back to your provider. And more importantly, you need to ask for diabetes self-management education. You need to ask for that. And um, I would go ahead and do the retinopathy risk test. We shared the link earlier in the chat. All of those things will give you information that you can be armed with to take to your healthcare provider. Um, and if one of my colleagues will pull the um, estimated average glucose on the, um, um, diabetes.org screen and share, share that. That'll help Ethel see what, what the average, estimated average glucose is for an A1C of 10. What else? What other um, questions do you all have? Did, you, did I miss a question, you, another one you had Yvonne earlier? No. I see uh, Jenny has dropped in the chat. Any good resources for people who would like to get a diabetic eye exam but are not sure what providers offer them? Oh, uh, that's a great question. And that would be an ophthalmologist, which is a medical doctor who specializes in eye health or an optometrist can also do. Uh, they're trained as eye doctors. Uh, they're not medical doctors per se, but they do eye care and eye health. So you could go to um, either, either of those. And many of the eyeglassware companies have an optometrist on site. So you can certainly do that. So Jessica shared the diabetes A1C link. Um, Great question. What chances of becoming having diabetes if you had gestational diabetes in first pregnancy? Um, if untreated, meaning you're not, you know, adopting a healthy lifestyle, um, it, being physically active after gestational diabetes, given it went away, you know, provided it went away, and the next you've got about a five. Uh, you've got about a 50% a chance of developing it within five to 10 years. So after that baby, you really want to adapt that healthy lifestyle 
so that you can really, you know, improve your chances of preventing diabetes. And even a five to 7% weight reduction goes a long way in helping prevent uh, prediabetes and type two diabetes. So important, along with that physical activity that Jessica talked about. Hey, it's the matter again. My question was, hey, Mr. Um, Daniel well, stated that, that there was no real true diet so for diabetic. Mm -hmm. So is that something that we should not be telling our patients okay, or we should be you. telling them to okay. just watch their sugar intake and their carb intake or how does that, you know, that work? Is that your bond? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Yvonne. Yeah, you're fine. I keep forgetting. That's a great question. Now, and I think it's good, you know, when you're face to face with, you know, the person, especially if they're newly diagnosed, they want some out the door suggestions, right? And certainly, you know, trying to encourage them that they're a big sweet eater to cut back on the sweets or cut back on the regular colors or what have you is a, is a good first step. But, you know, that only takes them so far, correct? So I think, you know, it's really important to, as soon as possible, is to get them in, like Laura had mentioned, the SNES, in which an individual, you know, typically would meet with a registered dietitian to help formulate a more specific plan based upon their eating preferences, you know, their habits, finances, all those other considerations as well. But there certainly isn't anything wrong with giving them some guidance, you know, as an initial step. It's just that we want to take it further and customize it because long term, it's going to be more successful for them if it's, you know, based upon their needs um, as opposed to just a cookie cutter or blanket type of a don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, you know, that, that type of uh, thinking. Great question. So the physician or the dietitian should basically take the diet and gear it around that patient more yeah. so than just a wide range of, of people. Yeah, so. yeah, I, ideally so, because again, you know, even the physicians and our, you know, physicians, you know, they can be great educators and, you know, certainly they can even be part of the DSNDS, you know, care team, and, and they are, of course, as a BCP, but yeah, you know, it's the registered dietitian nutritionist, you know, that's going to sit down individually one-on-one -on -one with the individual to help to formulate that specific plan to meet their needs. Um, you know, years ago, we we know many people in the office, you know, providers will do the tear-off sheet and give them generic meal plans. Again, long-term, those simply just do not work. It really has to be drilled down to the specific need of the individual to make it, you know, successful long term for them. I added the link. There was a question on genetics and diabetes, and I added a link to some of the info. Um, so let me just, I'll give just a quick overview. Uh, one of the things that helped us understand, now I've been around a long time, but these studies were done before I you know, was in diabetes. But one of the studies that was done on individuals with type two diabetes was um, um, on identical twins to see if one identical twin had diabetes, would the other one have diabetes? And in type two diabetes, when one has it, the other's at very high risk and typically does get it. Had a couple patients one time, this has been years ago, when we primarily saw most people with diabetes in the hospital. It was really before there were many outpatient diabetes education programs. And he was from a, a, a rural area in Kentucky and he came in and he had type two diabetes fairly young probably in his 30s, mid to late 30s. And he had every complication, which I won't get into, but he had all the complications. This was probably back in the 90s, maybe. And he ended up having, he lost a limb and, and you know, just had a cardiovascular bypass, all that. 
and his brother, his twin brother lived in California. All right, a different environment, let's just say, than where he lived in rural Kentucky. And about five years later, so it took a little longer, the identical twin went through the exact same pattern, like going through the cardiovascular bypass, then having some problems with his, um, um, his limbs, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm just telling you that because that shows you that deep genetic um, connection in type two. Now with type one diabetes, um, it's less common. And generally speaking, and you'll see all this written out uh, there, but if it's, it's less common for a child to develop type one, not out of the, you know, totally out, out of the woods, but less common and actually more common if the dad has type one than the mom. And if the mom has type one and had the baby after 25 years old, then um, it's less likely. And we don't know why that is unless there's some sort of, if the mother's had it for a number of years and developed some sort of a immunity protection, we don't know the answer. Um, so some good info with that link there. Just a FYI, my father had diabetes and I'm one of nine children and all of my brothers are diabetic. None of us girls are diabetic. Isn't Not that one. Something? Isn't that something? Yes. My mother doesn't have diabetes. Her, uh -huh. her, her father did, but my mother never developed it. But my dad had diabetes and he had it really, really bad. And all of my brothers are diabetic, but none of my sisters, none of us girls, it's four girls and five boys. None of us girls are diabetic. None. We never had gestational or anything, which is kind of sort of, you know, I mm -hmm. guess a genetic thing or whatever, but it, it is kind of weird that it, it's like yes. that. We don't have data really with type 2 diabetes to tell us, you know, if it follows a, a um, gender path. But, you know, also, if you have remained active, eaten healthy, you know, those kinds of things, I think that really makes a huge difference for people across the board, you know, really paying attention and, and you know, that. So, yeah. So someone asked, my son was diagnosed with prediabetes and has really constricted eye muscles. Should we be concerned with diabetic eye disease? I think that would be a question for your ophthalmologist or your optometrist to really circle back with them and see if there's a relationship between the two. That's not a typical complication of diabetes, you know, that we see. But again, it would be something to circle back and ask that question. So what else? What else do y'all have? We've got a few more minutes. I know a little earlier, uh, Denise Beck asked, do you know of any resources for non-readers to help them with managing diabetes? Non-readers, meaning people that can't read, I mean, that they have difficulty reading. I'll also um, invite Denise, if you're able to come on and talk a little bit more about maybe some people you're working with that we could help find resources for. Oh, and Denise. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. so we, I've encountered several patients that are not literate so for them when we're going through like um, some of the handouts on my diabetes plate and different things like that they have a hard time when they go to the grocery store with label reading and with different things like that and I um, have done research to try to find you know apps and materials I started trying to develop some stuff but with my time I just I time is not it, time's not my friend sometimes with that kind of stuff. So um, I will tell you that we are in the process of working on what we call infographics. And I know you've seen those that are very picturesque for our really to be companion uh, pieces to our narratives that we have. Okay. So stay tuned. We're not there yet, but stay tuned. And I'm, I just wrote that down to remind myself you know, again, of the need of those types of things out there, because you're right, you know, people need to be able to see and um, be able to have symbols and things with, if they can't read, 
um, their literacy is lower, that they would be able to, um, um, to you know, have things to help educate them. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Thank you. The other thing I've used before too, and Daniel and Jessica can can chime in as well, is like I save like save cereal boxes, you know, uh, milk cartons rinsed out, of course. But you know, I've saved all these different things, and that way you've got the look of the product, and then you can show from the label perspective, you know, the serving and the number of carbs. So if you can focus on numbers, if that person understands numbers, that can help some, at least from the, the meal planning perspective. Daniel? No, I agree. Uh, and you have to have various teaching tools, you know, especially, you know, if a individual, you know, is lower literacy. Um, I think food models, props, you know, are very effective. You probably have seen, for example, the larger and smaller size, you know, um, soda bottles in which you fill up with the corresponding amount of sugar or salt or whatever, for example, and those provide a great visual, you know, because a lot of people just simply aren't aware, you know, what's in the foods, especially the beverages that we consume. So I had visuals like that so they can see, oh my gosh, there's, you know, 10 teaspoons of sugar in this small quantity of cola you know, that can be a very effective visual um, apart from, you know, the written materials again. So we've got a few minutes left. Let's pull, I need, we need some, uh, Jessica needs some exercise questions. She's just dying to answer your exercise questions. What do you got? What do y'all have? I have a question um, with exercise. Would walking at a regular pace be okay for an exercise for someone who may not be able to do like running or anything like that? Absolutely. Everyone is so different. Um, so to tie into that, there's no specific diabetes diet because everyone has different needs. Everyone has different needs when it comes to exercise or physical activity. Exercise is sometimes seen as a dirty word. So just being physically active, moving your body as much as you can. Um, so for some people, holding onto a shopping cart and going an extra lap around the grocery store is significant enough for them for it to really count. Um, other people need to you know, get their heart rate up a little higher, but it's all dependent on the individual. Um, so absolutely walking. Walking is my exercise of choice. Um, pushing a stroller makes it that much harder. So everyone is going to have a different um, seat to fill in that sense of where what exercises they can do. Another one that came up, Jessica, is what is a good exercise for someone that's not very active? What about gardening? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, getting down on the ground to be pulling weeds, to be moving around dirt and plants. The thing is to find activities that you enjoy. If exercise or an activity doesn't make you happy doing it, then it's not, it shouldn't be what you're picking as your exercise routine. Mm -hmm. um, I personally wouldn't take like a kickboxing course, but I would go and take some kind of other activity you know, so absolutely being in a garden is hard work. So that counts as exercise. Some people have very physically active jobs, you know, they can count that. It's important to encourage people rather than scold them that they're not doing X, Y, and Z. So you want, remember how you're feeling when you're exercising and that when you're feeling good, that's the kind of exercise you want to repeat. Another one that came up is, is a sit and exercise just as beneficial? sometimes not able to be mobile. Absolutely. Um, so there's different exercises, whether it's just toe tapping, increasing your range of motion. When possible, try to incorporate or see if someone can meet with a physical therapist as well to see what extra exercises are safe for them if they have limitations in their mobility. Um, I did see one about housework and it, you know, depending on what kind of vacuum you have, I have an older vacuum and I have to push that thing hard and I feel a little sore after I do the whole house. So 
I think housework can count as exercise if you're really giving yourself a deep clean. Yeah. Um, it looks like um, there's some other meal planning and then we'll wrap up, Aurora. I know we've got six minutes, so let's try to get those in. Um, let's see. There was one on sweeteners that I saw. Can't get to it. Yes, I think from Kay, it says, can you briefly explain the effects of artificial sugars on glucose? Sure, that's a great question. Um, most of your uh, sweeteners, uh, your artificial sweeteners would be very low in carbohydrates. And since it's the carbohydrate uh, that's um, affecting, uh, primarily affecting blood sugar, the sweetener itself should have a negligible effect. Now, it's not to say that the food itself or the beverage itself, for example, if you take a sweetener and you place it in a cup of regular coffee, the sweetener shouldn't have an effect upon blood sugar, but there is caffeine in the coffee that's caffeinated. Caffeine can also affect blood sugar. Likewise with sugar-free products. You know, sugar-free doesn't mean carbohydrate-free. You can go to the store and buy a sugar-free cookie it may have been made with an artificial sweetener, but that cookie still has, you know, wheat, it's made from flour, that's a carbohydrate source as well. So just keep that in mind as well. But the sweetener itself, being very low in carbohydrates, should not have a, a significant effect upon blood sugar or blood glucose levels. We also have one from Brenda that says, any suggestions for controlling sugar cravings? You know, again, a lot of times people will try to dance around the issue. You know, maybe they have a, a sweet tooth and you know, gosh, they're really missing their favorite sweet. And they try to dance around and eat this food or that food and ultimately go back to that food anyhow. So in some cases, you know, as long as you're watching quantity, how much, how often, maybe having a smaller portion of that can help with that sweet tooth and still not affect blood sugar in a significant way. Um, using, again, in moderation, looking at the labels for the carbohydrates of a sugar-free product, you know, can be helpful. Uh, you know, a, a container of sugar-free gelatin, maybe some sugar-free pudding a very small scoop of some sugar-free ice cream. Again, you're still having to taste that sweetness, but you're typically not getting as many carbohydrates if you were using the regular product. And taste buds, you know, change over time. It, it, it doesn't happen overnight, but the more that you train the taste buds to stay away from or limit those super sugary sweet foods and beverages, it will become easier over time. So just stick with it. Uh, we also had a question from Bonnie a little earlier, if there are any resources for lower income diabetic clients to receive free or discounted gym memberships, or um, for Jessica, maybe more broadly, if there's alternatives to sort of gym memberships that you can think of to help folks get exercising. Uh, well, something I had worked with in the past um, had been the Silver Sneakers program. So checking in your area to see if those are available. Uh, that can give individuals um, a free gym membership, basically. Um, sometimes it comes down to research to see what gym options are available. Um, if there's insurance cards available, if your insurance offers some kind of discount there. But if you have access with a um, TV or internet access, there's so many free resources on YouTube for exercise. Um, it's, it's hard to compete with any of that. Uh, those are, you know, any type of, uh, you know, variation in your choice, you know, yogas, things like that. There's some really great opportunities there. Excellent. Well, I think that's pretty much it. I did see someone put, some, when are we going to talk about feet? And I will tell you, we have a, a amputation prevention program coming. And as soon as we get that up and moving, you know, we will look at some resources at some time that some of us can come 
and talk to you. So hopefully you got lots of good um, um, links and ideas, some for recipes. Um, we just, uh, yeah, we're excited to be here and um, let us know if you need anything else. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Laura and Daniel and Jessica. We appreciate you guys coming here. Thank you. Have a great night. All right. See you.